What are you afraid of in your life? What is the real power of fear in your life? And what is the Bible's miracle cure for the disease of fearitis? We'll be exploring answers to these important questions and more on this edition of Your Hope Today. Your Hope Today is a weekly radio broadcast bringing you practical advice from God's Word, the Bible. Our program is designed to inspire, inform, and uplift all people with the power of hope. Your Hope Today is on the air because we believe that real and reasonable hope is the foundation for all positive change. Hope is the bedrock of faith, the backbone of accomplishment, and the architect of success. Let's discover the path to a life more abundant through the power of hope. Welcome to Your Hope Today. I'm Joshua Burke. Today we're going to pull the power plug out of fear in your life. We are going to knock those things that you fear down to what they really are, which is nothing at all. And we're going to explore the Bible's miracle cure for fearitis. But before we get into any of these exciting topics, let's pray together and ask God's divine presence in our time together today. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you in the name of Jesus Christ and ask that you would bless every listener today with ears to hear and understanding, so that you may be glorified as we seek to find new freedom together in you. We invite you into this time and broadcast to speak to us by your Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So what are you afraid of in life? I mean, deep down, what are your core fears, the ones that drive your behavior? Now, it's okay not to have the answer to this question. Most people don't ever discover these core fears without searching and prayer before God. We may know our surface fears all too well, though. We may be afraid of losing a job, losing health, friends, mates, money. We may be afraid of acquiring something negative, like a hardship, a bad reputation, or disease. When you look at these surface fears, you're looking at the dim reflection of your deeper core fears, and you begin to see how those fears motivate you and how they change your behavior. Today on Your Hope Today, we're going to blow the cover on fears and give you God's prescription for dealing with fearitis in your life. I'm going to begin this episode by telling you the great secret about your fears, and then I'll try to bear up that statement through the rest of our time together. So what are fears? You feel them, don't you? They creep over you like a cold shadow. They smother you down like a wet blanket. They make your heart race, and they can cause you to change the way you act and react in any given situation. But what are they, though? Have you ever thought about what fears are made of? Where do they get their power? And why do they affect us so strongly? The answer to all these questions is so simple that it's hard to believe. The answer is that fears are literally nothing at all. Fears have no actual power other than what we give them, and fears have no impact on our behavior when we don't heed them. Fears are, in fact, nothing at all. Now, let me give you an example. You and a friend are going on a trip to Niagara Falls. You visit the site and see the wonderful observation tower that peers over the falls. You and your friend go up the elevator and walk to the edge to see the falls. Now, as you approach the edge, your friend hesitates and eventually just sits down. Your friend confesses to you a fear of heights, and you can tell by his or her look and demeanor that this is a real fear for them. You have enjoyed the view of the falls from high above, and your friend has lost an experience at Niagara and possibly suffered an embarrassment as well. Now, Later that day, your friend decides that you should take the boat out into the falls to experience the power and the grandeur of this natural wonder. You reluctantly agree but find yourself gripping the sides of the boat during the short trip with your eyes tightly closed because of a fear of water. Your friend, who is cowering in fear on the observation deck, is reveling in the spray of the falls, while you, who were so bold once before, are missing a grand adventure into the power of the falls. So now we ask a question. Were these fears what we would call irrational? But whose fears were irrational? Well, the other person's fears were obviously irrational, weren't they? But we might have reasons for our own fears. And because we have reasons, they become rational in our own mind. Now, your fictional friend was probably feeling the same way about your boat ride into the whirlpool of the falls, wondering what caused you to be so afraid of water. Now, I'll ask another question. What exactly is a rational fear? 
When I ask myself this question, I come up with answers like fear of losing a loved one, fear of ill health, fear of missed opportunities, and, and things like this. But if I dig a little deeper into my fears and ask what my fearfulness of those things does for me, what benefit does being afraid of these things bring to me, well then I come up empty-handed. I am compelled to admit that my fears do not benefit me in any positive way. If I am in a dreadful situation, being able to respond without fear will always serve me far better than a response that comes from fear. We might recognize logically that our fears are nothing at all. We can sit around and think logically about them and, and say that they aren't real and say that they don't mean anything. And that's all fine and good until we're faced with our fearful situation. One that we know causes a response in us. Maybe it's heights or water or some other phobia. Maybe you go to work every day wondering if it will be your last. And when we come face to face with these fears, these actual situations, well then the rules change and we find ourselves right back in the grips of our fearful response. So what should we do? How can we move past these fears and put them to rest? Well, the first step is to recognize that our fears are nothing. And the second step is to realize that our body believes otherwise. Understanding that our body, mind, and spirit disagree about the nature of fear is of extreme importance, and it is the key to unlocking the solution to fearfulness in our lives. The key to this body, mind, spirit maze is getting our order of authority right. Now, once we figure out who we're going to believe when fearful situations arise, well, then we're on our way to freedom from fear. Most of us, maybe even all of us, tend to believe our body's response to fear. Now, neuroscience tells us that the brain has a construct for making us afraid. It's called the amygdala. What this almond-shaped part of the brain does is create associations and connections between events for us. So, if we are fairly sure that we'd like to run away from a black bear if we see one while hiking, which is one possible event, then, if we see a large black figure among the trees while we walk, our amygdala will create an association with that black figure, identify this as the black bear that we would do well to run away from, and prepare our bodies to run. Now, if that black figure turned out to be a large black garbage bag being blown around a bit by the wind, well, then we'd feel silly. But if it were a bear, we'd be glad we could run away so quickly. The amygdala of the brain is excellent at helping to protect us from such dangers by making quick decisions and associations, but it's not very discriminating. And that's where we get into trouble with our fears. When we create a fearful association with something, it's hard to shake, even if we know better intellectually. We have to take time and examine the thing that causes us fear and determine, really, whether it is to be feared or not. But, when we're feeling all those feelings and everything our body says, get out, it's tough to stick around and investigate. <laughs> and it may not be safe after all. What if your amygdala was right? This is where we come to the point which can really set us free from fears. The process will feel a bit foreign to you at first, but over time you'll come to do it instinctively. When our fears come, whatever they are, they touch off that portion of our brain which causes fear. That part of the brain is powerfully connected to the body and causes strong physical reactions in us. We then act on those physical responses because they feel so real and are so strong for us. The problem is that it's all backwards. The question becomes, who are you going to believe? Allow me to explain. Have you ever noticed that just before every strong emotion comes to us, there's a point of decision. Now, this is especially true of negative emotions like anger and fear. But think about this with me just for a moment. And I'll give you an example, and I'll use anger because this emotion gives us the easiest pattern to understand. Now, think about the last time someone was speaking harshly or doing something that eventually made you angry. Now, you tolerated the behavior or the words up to a certain point, And then you hit that invisible threshold where you said inside, that's it. And then you became angry. What happened, in short, was that you chose to become angry at the person or situation. But the most interesting part of this process happens for us in that moment just before we decide. It's in that exact instant that we discover that our emotions are more in our control than we think. 
Now, I'm not talking about being startled or frightened in a moment when you're taken by surprise. Those responses are largely instinctual. I'm talking about the feelings you choose to have in regards to a situation or another person. Now, here's the most amazing thing. When we are in that instant where we decide to be angry or not, we discover that we have a choice with our emotions. Now, if we think about this for a moment, we'll realize that if we have a choice, we must be able to select between two things. But what are our options? We could look on the surface and just say that we could choose to be angry or not angry. This is often difficult for us because we want to express our anger. And there isn't any benefit to the other choice of not being angry. In fact, we might lose out if we choose not to express our emotions in that moment, and it might even be healthy for us to express our anger constructively. Choosing to feel angry holds all the cards for us, because we have no real reason to choose otherwise. So we have a choice between two things, and we don't know what the other thing is. But we do know that it's not as simple as feeling or not feeling, because that doesn't work for us. We'll find the answer to this puzzle in a rather unlikely place. In Romans chapter 7, verses 14 through 25, Paul lets us glimpse in on his own struggle with this exact thing. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am a flesh, sold into bondage to sin. For what I am doing, I do not understand. For I am not practicing what I would like to do, but I am doing the very thing I hate. But if I do the thing I do not want to do, I agree with the law, confessing that the law is good. So now, no longer am I the one doing it, but sin which dwells in me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is, in my flesh. For the willing is present in me, but the doing of the good is not. For the good I want, I do not do, but I practice the very evil I do not want. But if I am doing the very thing I do not want, I am no longer the one doing it, but sin which dwells in me. I find, then, the principle that evil is present in me, the one who wants to do good. For I joyfully concur with the law of God in the inner man, but I see a different law in the members of my body, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner to the law of sin, which is in my members." Wretched man that I am, who will set me free from the body of this death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, on the one hand, I myself, with my mind, am serving the law of God, but on the other, with my flesh, the law of sin. Paul is wrestling with this exact same issue of his behaviors. His response is to the world, which come from his flesh. But notice what Paul tells us in the midst of this passage. For I joyfully concur with the law of God in the inner man, but I see a different law in the members of my body. Now, Paul makes a distinction for us between two decision makers in our lives. We have the inner man, which is our spiritual self, our true self. That's the real you. And we have the law that governs the members of our body, which in other places Paul refers to as the carnal man. Now, Paul tells us that these two are in conflict with each other, and the conflict revolves around the fact that each wants two completely opposite outcomes. The inner spiritual person wants to do the will of God, obey the word of God, and be the conduit of God's work. And then there is this outward, fleshy, physical person that wants to satisfy its needs and desires. It wants to fulfill itself and its own mission and passions and needs. Now, Paul calls this the carnal man. I love how Paul cries out in the end of this section by saying, Wretched man that I am, who will set me free from the body of this death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now when Paul mentions the body of death, I believe he's making reference to a Roman custom of punishment for perpetrators in Paul's day with this verse. In Roman times, a murderer would often be bound hands and feet to the body of his victim and released back into the community. As the murderer tried to go about his business, the body of the victim would weigh him down and encumber every movement, every motion. As it decayed and putrefied, it would ultimately kill the perpetrator as well. Now, although scholars are unsure of Paul's reference here, I think the illustration is far too poignant to ignore. It is literally the body of death that we drag around as we walk through life, trying to do what we should. But here is the great revelation of Paul's words in Romans 7. And this is something that I struggle with for a long time in my own spiritual life. 
I read those words of Paul and I focused on the struggle, the fight, the waging war between the carnal man and the spiritual man, and I made a terrible assumption. I assumed that this carnal man was an equal foe to the spiritual man, matched on every level, and that the struggle was one that I would have to carry out in earnest on a daily basis in order to not be dragged down by this foe in my spiritual walk. And what a terrible error I made. I failed to take seriously the last part of Paul's verses, that it is a body of death. It is like that corpse that hangs from the offender, pulling and slowing him down, causing him to stumble, but it cannot stop him. It does not have to prevent us from doing what we are capable of, because we can be set free from it. And who shall set us free? Thanks be to God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, these discussions of flesh and spirit can tend to get very deep very fast, but I don't think that's where we need to start. It seems to me that a practical place to start is seeing if Paul's words are true in our own experience. Now let's see if we can discover this internal conflict within ourselves and find a way to at least see the truth of what Paul's describing. Now in my earlier examples I talked about anger and I used it as a way of pinpointing that moment when we choose to be angry. But the truth of the matter is that this decision point occurs with all emotions and especially anger and fear. But what can we do about fear? Now let's explore Paul's words in the light of our fears for a moment. Paul asserts that there are two laws at work within us. We have the law of the spirit of life and the law of sin and death. The law of the spirit pertains to our true self, our spirit man, the real you. And the law of sin and death is at work in our members, in our flesh, and that is within our bodies. Paul also tells us that Paul's inner man, the real Paul, wants to do good, but that he's hindered in doing good because of this law at work in his flesh. He says, for I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is, in my flesh. For the willing is present in me, but the doing of the good is not. For the good that I want, I do not do, but I practice the very evil that I do not want. So let's break it down. There are two yous that we have to deal with here. Your natural person and your spiritual person. In that moment when a strong emotion is coming and you are reaching that point of decision, you aren't choosing whether to have the feeling or not. You are choosing between responding from the body and brain or from the spiritual you, which is the real you. Now that changes the picture for us a bit and places a little more weight in favor of responding from the spirit. This is our real choice in the matter. We will respond from the standpoint of the body and brain or we will respond from our true self, our spiritual person. Now, I know what you're thinking because I've thought it myself. You're thinking, how can I change my responses to things like that? When I'm mad, I'm mad. And when I'm afraid, I'm afraid. Well, I've been there. And in fact, I still get caught up in this quite often. This is tough work. But here is the key. And if we use the key over and over again, we'll begin to see our lives changing quite a bit around us for the positive. So here it is. When anger or fears beset you, and you are in that blink of an instant, when you are deciding to respond, Check in with your true self. Lift yourself out of the situation for just a moment and see yourself and ask, who is affected by this? Is it your true self or is it your carnal physical self? The effect of this simple question can be quite shocking. Now, it's such a simple and powerful question. I ask myself this way, am I disturbed by this? And when I say I, I'm referring to my true spiritual self. And I wait for an instant for my answer. And then I realize in that moment that my physical self is all worked up over such and such. And that my true spiritual self is still at perfect peace. It's quite a sensation when you see it for the first time. So it's all well and fine for me to go on about how we should behave and act and react from the spirit and not from the flesh, isn't it? We all know that living this out is far more difficult than this simple explanation. So many times we can discuss walking according to the spirit and not according to the flesh, but nobody ever tells us how to do it. Scripture is full of examples of people who wrestle like we will wrestle. And we can identify with each person's struggle with this very thing. Even Jesus during his temptation in the wilderness. The devil tried to get him to meet his physical needs and to respond from the body and not from the leading of the spirit. It's a battle that we all face but it's one in which we don't have a lot of tools with which to fight. So let's put this into practice and see what it looks like when just a regular person uses this quick check up from the neck up, as Zig Ziglar used to say. Several months ago, 
I was in an unavoidable fender bender. A truck had swerved hard left from his lane, leaving me one car length to stop before hitting a stopped car that was attempting to pull into a parking lot. The problem was that I hit that car, which rolled to hit another car, which was pushed into another car coming the other direction from the parking lot, waiting to come out on the street. So my simple and unavoidable fender bender turned into a four-car accident. Needless to say, I wasn't a happy camper. As I got ready to step out of the car, I asked myself that same simple question that I'm asking you to ask yourself. I asked myself, am I disturbed by this? And my internal answer to the question was no. I saw in that moment my physical self all upset and angry about the accident and embarrassed about the inconvenience to everyone. I noticed that my body was tight and I had all this adrenaline running through me because of the situation. I also noticed that my real self wasn't in the least bit disturbed by this. <laughs> it was quite an experience. In that instant, I saw my two selves standing in stark contrast to each other. I also noticed that my body didn't really change its response. I was still very embarrassed about the whole thing, and that I was very keenly aware of the inconvenience to everyone involved. So this simple check-in made a world of difference in the outcome of that high-stress situation for me personally. So what about you? Can you think of times when you could use the checkup from the neck up to change your responses to your circumstances? How about when facing an angry supervisor or an apathetic customer service person? How about when you think about your own fears? The easiest way for us to talk about this check-in is in relationship to our responses to external situations and personal encounters. But the real power of the check-in happens when we are alone with ourselves and our many fears. Going back to the beginning of our broadcast today, I asked you to think about those fears in your life, and I told you that we were going to give you the Bible's miracle cure for fearitis. Well, here it is. When you think about those core fears, and you will probably need to spend some time thinking about them, you'll notice your body starting to react and respond to the thought of the fear. But then, you'll ask yourself your question, however you choose to phrase it, am I disturbed by this? And notice that your true, real, and spiritual self is not disturbed, but that your body is still responding as it always has. You are looking at the two yous that Paul so keenly describes in Romans chapter 7. But here is the key, a secret to winning over your fears. Don't fight your fears. Don't come at them with this newfound knowledge and this technique and say, I've got you now, like you're going to drive them away. No, this is a mistake. You simply allow them to be what they are, where they are, and realize that you, the real you, has nothing at all to do with them. This is amazingly powerful. What happens when we fight our fears, when we struggle against them and treat them like opponents, is that we add our strength to them. When that happens, we see their ferocity and their tenacity and their stubbornness. But whose ferocity is it? Whose tenacity? Whose stubbornness? It's ours. We fuel the fears. We give them strength and energy and fight. I think our negative emotions, and especially our fears, are like those punching clowns that you can inflate and they snap back after you hit them. The harder you hit them, the more ferociously they snap back at you. If we don't fight against them, rise up to conquer them, or even regard them at all, our fears will eventually stop bouncing back like that punching clown. We'll see our fears for what they are, which is nothing at all. We'll simply leave them alone. Let's take a few scriptures about fear and look at the theme of fear as it's treated in scripture. We have 2 Timothy 1.7, For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. And there's 1 John 4.18, There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, because fear involves torment, but he who fears has not been made perfect in love. And my personal favorite, Joshua 1.9, Have I not commanded you? Be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid, nor be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. So we can take a step back from scripture and sum up all of these scriptures about fear with a simple phrase that has accompanied nearly every divine encounter that is recorded in scripture. Fear not. Now he isn't telling us that our bodies won't tremble and our legs won't get weak. He's telling us not to let fear be in charge of us. We can begin this journey out of our fears by using the check-in question that I've given you today and being sensitive to your internal answer. Now, when you first start to do this, it won't make a bit of difference. 
and you might be tempted to think that it doesn't work, but be persistent. Your negative thoughts and attitudes are persistent with you already. Be persistent in your desire to catch a glimpse of your true spiritual self, and you will be rewarded. The rewards aren't just new options and choices in our situations. The rewards are also understanding that the real you, your spiritual self, is far greater than your physical, carnal self. And you will come to realize the truth of Paul's words. Who will set me free from the body of this death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Your fears are nothing at all. Treat them that way and they'll fade away. Thank you for listening to Your Hope Today. It is our mission to inspire, inform, and uplift all people with the positive power of hope. If you would like to listen to other broadcasts of Your Hope Today, please visit us at yourhopetoday.com. Your Hope Today is almost entirely listener-supported. If you have been blessed or benefited by this radio ministry, please consider supporting Your Hope Today in three ways your prayers, your presence, and your donations. Please pray for the success of this program, the well-being of our staff, and God's providence in the lives of our listeners and those that need to listen. Please commit to listen regularly to this program. We believe that it is easier to maintain a hopeful outlook than it is to regain one. And finally, if you feel that this radio outreach has benefited you or others, please consider supporting Your Hope Today with a regular donation to keep this ministry on the air and help it to grow into the global outreach that we believe it can be. You can make your donation by visiting yourhopetoday.com and selecting Support YHT on the front page of the site. Thank you for listening. Please join us next week for another edition of Your Hope Today. Until then, may God bring you strength for today and bright hope for tomorrow.